I'd like to start today with a quick review of where we've been so far in this series on Why Church, and also let you know that if you'd like to follow along with a fill-in-the-blank, then there's one in your bulletin. Hopefully you have a pen or a writing utensil. If that distracts you, just set it down. We'll start today with a quick review of what we've covered so far in our series. First thing is that we've seen to have a people called out, belonging to God, led by Jesus, gathering locally, bearing witness universally. That is God's intent and God's design. The ecclesia, the church, is God's creation, not man's invention. And we have seen that the church exists to do good. We went over that last week. We are commanded in Galatians to do good to all people. And so God uses the church as a vehicle, as a vessel, as the means by which to bring his love and goodness into the world. And he also uses the church to take very special care of his family of believers. We've covered that so far this morning. We're going to focus on three traits that are found in a healthy church. These are experiences that believers can and should expect as they gather together consistently. Each one of these traits is part of the purpose of the church. Let's pray. Father, we approach your word now. It is with humility and a desire to know you better. Lord, we want to understand what you have to say to us. We want to receive your word implanted into our hearts. God, that it can affect the change that you have uh, designed for us, intended for us on this very day as we understand and receive your truth. May your truth be exalted and impressed upon us, Lord, and anything that's not your truth. Quickly forgotten, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So, first thing first. There's a bit of feedback on that monitor. Maybe just shut the whole thing down. Church is where we encounter God in worship. Fill it in the blanks. The first one is E-encounter. We encounter God in worship. What is worship? Theologian William Temple has a definition of worship I'm going to share with you. He says this about worship. Worship is a submission of all our nature to God. It is a quickening of the conscience by His holiness and nourishment of mind with His truth. The purifying of imagination by his beauty. The opening of the heart to his love. The surrender of will to his purpose. And you thought worship was like a little hour on Sunday. Worship is all this. All this gathered up, he says, in adoration. Most, the most selfless emotion of which our nature is capable. And therefore the chief remedy for the self-centeredness, which is our original sin. And the source of all actual sin. Worship, it has been said, is the chief end of man. And if that's the case, then that helps us understand what our purpose is. Why are we here on earth? Why did God make us? He made us so that we would glory in Him, which is to enjoy Him. That we wouldn't be afraid of Him, that we wouldn't run away from Him, and that we wouldn't fight with Him, but that we would enjoy Him. So He made us that we would glory in Him, and He made us so that we would glorify Him, that we would bring honor to His name. So we are here not to draw attention to ourselves, not even to build our own lives in our own kingdom, but to point to God and the goodness of God. That's why we exist and we do that in worship. Declaring the greatness. Declaring the worth. You think of worship, you can think of worthship. Declaring the worth of God. Now worship is an ongoing endeavor. We could easily call it a lifestyle. Not just something we do on a Sunday morning, but a way of living that includes becoming sensitive to God, more and more sensitive to His Spirit, and acknowledging His presence and His perfection in the world and the circumstances that surround us. We worship every day, beloved, as we place ourselves at God's beck and call. We begin with prayer and thanksgiving in the morning. We pray and we walk and we talk with God throughout the day. We listen to Him. We go where He wants us to go. We see who He wants us to see. We do what He wants us to do. We read from His Word. We pray again. We thank Him for another day to enjoy and do His will. That's the life of the believer from sunrise to sunset, from beginning to end. That's what Paul's talking about a bit in Romans 12.1 where he says, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, because God's been so good to you, Offer your bodies, offer yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. So we have this individual worship. That is our lifestyle. It's the way that we live in the world. The daily offering of ourselves to the Lord. And we have something unique 
and something powerful, which we call corporate worship. Corporate in that it involves us coming together. We meet together for it. Remember, ecclesia means the called out ones. The church is called out. We are called out of our homes to assemble as a group. We make an effort to be together. And when we are together, we celebrate God. That's why we come together, to celebrate God. The early church was well known for its corporate worship. Acts 2, 46 and 47 says, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The first Christians got together just about every day to worship and praise God. Every day. And we struggle to get here on Sunday sometimes. And I'm paid. It's a struggle sometimes. <laughs> I mean, think about what our lives have become, folks, sometimes. We get so doggone busy that it's hard to get to church once a week for an hour or two. And yet these early Christians, they got together every day to praise God. Their worship included sharing meals and expressions of gratitude and singing praise. Acts 2.42 says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They learned together, they socialized, they had communion, they prayed. And Luke goes on to write this in verse 43, Acts 2.43. Everyone was filled with awe. And many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. Everyone was filled with awe. Awe characterized the worship. And the awe that filled these services that was in these early believers came from God. And from God's presence in their assembly. It was a reverential awe. A keen awareness of God in their midst. And listen, God's presence is what makes worship meaningful and powerful. And God's presence is what distinguishes worship from every other get-together that we're involved in. This is God's presence here, where two or three or more are gathered. He is in our midst. And God's presence can give to us that sense of awe. We encounter God, the awesomeness of God in worship. Or at least we want to, and we hope to. And if over time we find that we're not, I can just say something's wrong. It's really wrong if we ever make... Worship, if we could say that our worship is lifeless or boring or dead or you could fill in any of those, then we've made a mistake. Something's not right because worship is a celebration of God and God is not lifeless and God is not, there's nothing boring about God and God is not dead. We need to really think about that. We encounter God in worship. Now, if you've been part of a worshiping community for any time, you know that no Two worship experiences are ever the same. God shows up in lots of different ways in worship. We don't want worship services to always be the same. Worship isn't a formula that if we do this, that, and the other, we put in all these right ingredients, poof, we get the Holy Spirit. Isn't that nice? Every time. That's not how it works. And when you seek that, you're seeking an experience with God, not God himself. And you know there's a difference, beloved. It's a nuance, it's a fine line, but there's a difference between seeking an experience with God and seeking God himself. In worship, we're seeking God, and we want his manifest presence to be here, but we understand that it comes in many shapes, in many ways, in many forms. Sometimes, the worship that God inspires and wants in us is rather raucous and loud. Oh, not in here, but sometimes, in different places, it is. And if he wants it to be that way, don't you think it should be? And you've read the Psalms, I know, and it says shout, and it says dance, and it says praise with a loud voice and with instruments. And this is, what, this is one way to worship. There's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes God wants us, I believe, to worship loudly, boldly, confidently, with abandon. Forget about what other people think about you. Just do what God is calling you to do in worship and let it go. But sometimes our worship is hushed. Sometimes it is just muted. Sometimes the Holy Spirit just wants to hover, I think, in a way, and minister quietly to hearts and minds. Sometimes worship is characterized by conviction. An individual comes under conviction in worship of the power of the Spirit that he or she is in sin and has to repent. 
Sometimes the whole body comes under conviction. You feel the weight of the Spirit. But sometimes the Spirit shows up and His purpose seems to be just to fill your heart with joy. It's all He wants you to do is be happy and smile and revel in His presence. And sometimes God shows up in worship and what He really wants to do that day is comfort His people. And He says to them through worship, Snuggle up under my wings. There's all kinds of room for you in here. I love you. I'm with you. Don't ever doubt it. I care for you. That's all different kinds of experiences in worship. Same spirit, but different experiences in worship. So you see why we're not chasing after a particular worship experience. We want God to do in our midst whatever He wants to do in our midst. And when He does that, we are generally inspired with a sense of awe. We find awe in worship. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, the early church was trying to figure out how to worship, and there were some problems in the church, as there's always problems. If you get two or three people together, you're going to have problems, right? So there's problems in the church, and Paul's trying to straighten all that out and tell them how they should conduct themselves. But one thing he says toward the end of that chapter, I think it's 25th verse or so, talking about the experience of a non-believer coming into worship. He said, to come in such a way and hear what is being said so that he'll be convicted and convinced by all, so that the Spirit will work through the people who are prophesying there and telling and foretelling and foretelling the truth, such that he will fall down on his face and say, of, of a truth, God is with you. Surely God is among you. That's, that's kind of a good benchmark for worship. Not that everybody has to come through UBC and, you know, hit the ground. The idea is such that God is here and there's no denying it. And when the Spirit is at work, which is what the Spirit does, convincing and convicting, convincing us of truth, convicting us of sin, then anybody coming through the door should know there's something unique going on here. I may not understand it. I might not have been brought up in it. I, don't, I didn't grow up in it. But I can see something very real and spiritual is happening today. That's the encountering of God that we want in worship that you find in healthy churches. You find God there. Okay? Second, churches where we're encouraged through regular fellowship. We are encouraged through regular fellowship. We have two texts for this point. The first is Hebrews 10.25. That's a familiar verse, so I'll read it to you. I won't ask you to flip through there today. Save a little bit of time. Hebrews 10.25 says this, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The first thing we see in this verse is the importance of regularly meeting together. So Paul told us last week we saw in Galatians not to become weary in well-doing. Just as we're not to become weary in well-doing, we also aren't to become weary in worshiping. We are commanded to preserve the practice of coming together to worship. So the folks who want to worship virtually, you know, kind of plug into a service online or on TV are truly missing part of what God's intent is for his people. Doesn't mean you can't get good teaching. Doesn't mean that's not a bad, that, that is a good substitute if you can't get to worship. But this is what it's supposed to be. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Don't give up meeting together. Come together. Now apparently some people, believe it or not, had developed the habit of skipping out on worship. And... Uh, one might infer from the text that they had become discouraged. And discouraged, uh, we all understand discouragement. It's easy to become discouraged. They were struggling to hold onto this hope unswervingly as they were being commanded to hang on to this thing. And they, they dropped out of fellowship because, I don't know, they, their needs weren't being met. Somebody offended them. Um, it's quite possible, I think, in this context that some people thought Jesus hadn't come. They thought he was coming right back, and he wasn't back. So I think some were like, well, if he's not coming back, I'm not going to church uh, kind of thing. You can imagine there's just a, a bit of discouragement in there. And here's what the writer of Hebrews says. Look, look, don't do that, okay? Don't drop out of church and fellowship when you're feeling discouraged. Instead, take the focus off yourself and put the focus out there on others. This is what to do, the writer says. Shift your eyes outward. And get about the business of encouraging each other. Now the word translated encourage, beautiful word, means to call someone to your side. To call someone to your side. It is interestingly built from the same Greek word that, that we translate as church. Kaleo is the Greek 
Ecclesia is the called out. Encourage means to call near. The implication is that you call somebody near for the purpose of comforting them or strengthening them. This word is also translated exhort, which implies the use of words. So when the scripture tells us to encourage one another, it's saying that we are to be present for our brothers and sisters, literally calling them near and speaking words to them that they need to hear. That's what it means to encourage. Okay? The words that we speak could be words of instruction, they could be words of pleading, they can be words of comfort, of consolation, words of warning, whatever, whatever our brother and sister needs, that's what we are supposed to do. Get near to them and speak those words to them in their moment. Okay? They should be words, if we draw on verse 24, previous Hebrews 10:24, words that spur one another on to love and good deeds, which means they should be provocative words, inspiring words and certainly appropriate to the situation. They may not be words that somebody wants to hear. You're not, you're not being told to deliver everything anybody wants to hear. You're not being told to tickle ears. That's not what you're supposed to be doing, but you're supposed to be delivering a proper, appropriate word from Christ. Proverbs 15.23 says, A man finds joy in giving an apt reply, and how good is a timely word. So church is supposed to be this place where we give and receive encouragement. Anytime somebody then says, well, church is just not for me, and you hear this quite a bit, church just isn't for me, there's a profound truth in that that they may not be aware of. You're right, church is not for you. Church really isn't for you. Church is for others. Do we want you to be blessed in church? Absolutely. Do we want needs to be met here? Of course. But ultimately, if you're here for that... You're going to be disappointed at some point, but if you're here to encourage, you'll always find some work. And that's what church is about, getting together to encourage people in their faith and in their faith walk. Next text on this point is Hebrews 3.13. It says this, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Encourage one another daily. Hebrews 3.13. Now this could, be a, this could be overwhelming. This could be an overwhelming command. So let's, uh, let's take, take a look at it closely. Make sure we know what's being said. For instance, in a fellowship of our size, no one person is going to be able to encourage everybody else daily. That would be more than a full-time job for any of you to take that upon yourself. Well, I read the Bible. It says I'm supposed to. So I'm on the phone all day long. No. I like, don't, don't be overwhelmed by that. I like what Max Lucado said when we studied the Outlive Your Life material. He said, look, nobody can do everything, but everybody can do something. And that's the thing. You can't do everything, but you can do something. And part of the something that you're called to do as a follower of Jesus is encourage. Okay? And here's the gist of the teaching. Here's the context. And I would encourage you to go... I, hate pulling just one or two verses, so go ahead and read the whole thing when you get a chance. But here, here's what is being taught. Sin is always crouching at the door of every believer's heart. Always. We know this from Scripture. We know that we have an enemy who roams the earth uh, like a roaring lion, right? Seeking to devour whom he will. All right? So sin is always crouching at the door of every believer's heart. Sin is deceitful. Sin is alluring. Sin is dangerous. When sin is indulged by a person, whether in mind or body, it has a way of hardening a person. And by this, this scripture means sin, when it is indulged, can cause a person to become obstinate, can cause a person to become stubborn, Resisting the will and the ways of God. Now, before you start figuring out who I'm talking about, some of you are going, oh, I know who's got that problem. <laughs> Which is always a temptation. Listen, any of us, any of us is susceptible. Yes, I see the smirks on husbands and wives' faces. And they're, oh, got a sin problem, hon. No. Any of us is susceptible at any time 
to the temptation of sin. So nobody's excluded. No finger pointing unless you want it to come right back here. Look, read it for yourself. I am susceptible to sin's temptation. If, if I'm not careful, I can become a hardened person. I can let my heart become callous. I can become insensitive to what the Holy Spirit wants of me. That can happen to me, okay? Because we know it could happen to any of us. We need close relationships with people who really, really do love us and who have our best interests at heart. People who interact with us on a regular basis, who know us well enough that they would be able to see sin taking hold in our lives and then would call us to their side or would call us over or would call us up. Please call us and tell us what you see so that we don't have to suffer unnecessarily the consequences of sin in our lives. This is what it means to be encouraged. Churches where we are encouraged through regular fellowship. And lastly for today, churches where we are equipped for service. Churches where we are equipped for service. Ephesians 4, 11 to 13 says this, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, lists the offices and the functions in the church. Verse 12 speaks to the purposes of these, which ultimately is to equip the saints, okay, to prepare God's people. The word here, equip, it means to furnish completely, to give believers what is needed so they can perform works of service so that the church will be built up. Church is where we are equipped for service. Now, church is not the only place or the only means by which we are equipped. I think this body is mature enough to understand now. We've talked about it quite a bit. There's an expectation of self-feeding among Christians, okay? We have to go out and feed ourselves. If this is the only place you, you eat spiritually every week for an hour or two, you should be starving to death, okay? Nobody eats just one meal a week, do they, of anything? No, in fact, we look forward to meal after meal after meal, and so should it be spiritually where there's feeding going on all the time. This isn't just the only trough you stop at. It can't be because that's not enough to give you what you need to be the Christian God wants you to be. Okay, so we understand there's a responsibility in every Christian to be self-feeding. Christians should be self-fed, not spoon-fed. You agree with that? Mature Christians are, are all about getting after the Word and growing in their faith and understanding. In Hebrews, when the audience there was reprimanded, rebuked by the writer for not growing, it wasn't the church that was held at fault. They're on milk, they should be chewing on the meat, the writer says. You should be teachers, but as it is, you need to be taught all over again. You should be adults, but your babies. He's after the individual saying, you didn't, you didn't do what you're called to do. You've got to feed on the Word of God and the disciplines of prayer and fellowship and worship. Okay, so Christians have a responsibility, but at the same time, through the ministries of preaching and teaching especially, pastors and leaders in a church are expected to provide spiritual wisdom along with knowledge and skills for Christian living to the flock. That's my job, that's the job of the teachers, that's the job of the leaders. We are here to equip you in your Christian walk. And not just for you, even though the benefit is, should be for you, it benefits us all. The rising tide raises all the boats, right? We understand that, okay? Or you could go the other way and say the weakest link. But we're trying to get everybody to a level of maturity because then we all grow and the entire church grows. And that's what Jesus is saying. The church will be built up in unity. We'll be attaining to unity as we grow. The full measure of Christ. That's the job of the church. Now, I'm sure you've noticed this. The growth and the maturity 
of the church is not the world's concern. You pick up on that? The world doesn't really care if the Christian church grows or if the members of the Christian church mature in their faith at all. Okay? It's not the world's concern. And the systems of the world are not going to teach the truths of Scripture. They're not going to feed you the authoritative principles of God. Public schools are not going to do this. The university is not going to do this. The best workplace training program is not going to do this. They are not going to tell you about the Bible or about God's viewpoint. The essential education and equipping in this area of your life comes from the church. And those who will not affiliate with a healthy church this is how, why this stuff is practical. Why church? Wait, so why church? Why should I bother? Why does it matter? Listen, anybody who doesn't participate, doesn't want to be affiliated with, isn't committed to, a local healthy body of believers is choosing to venture out into the highways and the byways of life with much less equipment than is available to you. M many fewer tools than what you really need to be successful out there. The church is here to give you those tools. The church is here to give you that wisdom and that understanding so that when you go out, you are ready to live, really live, and confront the challenges of life and be totally successful. Now, that doesn't mean everything you touch your hand to is, you know, I'm not giving you a goose that lays a golden egg. That's not what this stuff is talking about. It just means you're ready. You can handle it. You can handle the ups and the downs. You've got the right lens to look through. You've got the right perspective. This is what the church gives. And when people don't want to be any part of the church, they're stuck with their own best guesses or worldly philosophies. And those things always, always come up short. Now, Peter puts it this way in 2 Peter 1.3. His divine power, that is God's, has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Everything we need for life and godliness. It comes from Him. But beloved, it often comes through His church. Father, thank You for Your truth and Your Word. Thank You for Your church. Lord, we certainly confess the imperfections we find in ourselves and then as a result, the imperfections we find in our local body. But we are so thankful that You love us even in those and that You tarry with us and that You persevere. Individually and corporately, Lord, that you're working your will and your way in our lives. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. Thank you for a body of believers. Thank you for a place we can come where we can encounter you. Thank you for the encouragement that we receive. Thank you for those who love us enough to give us what we need to do the work you call us to. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Five or ten minutes, we'll be back for a service for...